Thank you for coming out today, and uh, we want to welcome all of our friends and family watching online as well. Come on, can we give it up for our online family? Thank you for tuning in. We love you, and uh, right now is a perfect time if you're watching online to share uh, the screen that you're watching from or start a watch party because we want to help more people experience every victory in Jesus, and that would be wonderful. And uh, we are so thankful that you're here this morning. We're going to be continuing, actually, uh, bringing to an end a series that we started a number of weeks ago uh, entitled This Is That, uh, where we looked at topics uh, that people uh, don't know enough about and tend to reject um, because they don't know enough about them. And so we looked at some topics like that and, and tried to uh, bring understanding uh, because a lot of these things, all of these things that we've been talking about, although people have a hard time understanding them, they're actually something that's good for you. And so we've talked about praise and worship um, a number of weeks ago, and uh, we talked about how, man, when, when we do what we just did a few moments ago on a Saturday, you're called a fan, but when you do it on a Sunday morning, you're labeled a fanatic. Uh, and so we, we praise and worship the way we do because we are big fans of God. Amen? It's not, it's not a sin to love your favorite sports team, but I don't want to love my favorite sports team and celebrate them more than I love and celebrate my God. And so, uh, and so during that message, we talked about why we worship like we worship. We've talked about healing, how God is still in the healing business today. We also talked about a couple weeks ago about generosity. And, uh, and many of you in this room or watching online, you took that next step uh, in your generosity journey, and we want to say thank you for doing that, for uh, challenging yourself to do that. As Pastor Jerry mentioned today, many of us are bringing a Thanksgiving offering. If you forgot, that's okay. Thanksgiving is still two weeks away, uh, but we wanted to get this offering in early because there are a number of ministries and initiatives in Kingdom Builders that we want to be able to fully fund before the end of of the year, because how many know there's great needs, especially this time of year? And uh, many of you were with us last week, where Jack Reisner for Convoy of Hope shared with us how your generosity is making a difference, especially when it comes to us taking the fight to global and local hunger. And so we talked about generosity a couple weeks ago, and and shared with uh, all of you and explained why, uh, as as followers of Jesus, we have hearts to be generous. And so um, uh, today we're going to talk about the person of Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about Holy Spirit. And so I want you to go ahead and turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're going to begin there in just a moment. But Acts chapter 2 has been our foundational scripture during this series because it's in those verses in Acts chapter 2 where we actually get the phrase, this is that, this is that. And in Acts chapter 2, the church was born. And when the church was born, there were people that were looking at the birth of the church, and they couldn't comprehend it. They couldn't understand it. And so you'll see in, a few, in just a few moments as we begin to read these verses that because they couldn't understand it, that they either mocked it, made fun of it, or they rejected it. Peter stood up and said, hey, wait a minute. Before you reject what you're seeing and don't understand, or before you continue to make fun of it, this is actually for you. It's good for you. And he said, this is that. And so as we talk about Holy Spirit today, I know we've talked about praise and worship and healing, and we've talked about generosity. But in reality, Holy Spirit is the this is that that Peter is talking about. Because a few verses before the verses that we're going to read, the reason the people were confused is because the Holy Spirit had descended in the upper room on 120 and when the Holy Spirit descended on them and baptized them, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, spoke in other tongues, and it became very confusing to those around them. And so Peter pointed at what was happening, at what they were seeing, and said, hey, listen, this is that. This is what the, the prophet Joel prophesied about. This is what we've been waiting for. This is good. This is for you. This is for your children. This is for us. This is God. And so let's look at that in Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 12. The Bible says that the people were amazed and perplexed, and they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. And then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is that. 
which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And, what, and the that that, uh, that Peter was pointing to was when in, in Joel, the prophet Joel said in the last days that God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And so he's saying, this that you're seeing is that which Joel prophesied. And so today we want to talk about the Holy Spirit because listen to me, if you understood him, you would want him. And out of the three in the Godhead, or the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is probably the least known and the most misunderstood person of God. And so we're going to answer two questions. Who is he? And how can I know him? Let's begin with who is he? If you're taking notes, write this down. There's going to be a number of things I'm going to share with you, but all of them coming out of Scripture. There's going to be a number of Scriptures. All of them are going to be on the screen. Jot down the reference. But if you're taking notes, write this down. Who is he? Number one, first of all, he is a person. Holy Spirit is a person, and he's not weird. People are weird. People are weird with the Holy Spirit, but people are weird without the Holy Spirit. Because people are weird, but the Holy Spirit is not weird. And he won't make you weird. He'll make you wired, but he won't make you weird. I'm not weird. I'm just wired. I might even get wired this morning, but I promise you I'm not weird. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is a person. Why is that important to know? It's because if you don't understand that he's a person, you will not develop a personal relationship with him because you do not develop a personal relationship with objects or with things you develop a personal relationship with people with persons and so holy spirit is a person in fact i would say that the holy spirit is the most important person on planet earth today the most important person on earth today is not a king it's not a president. The most important person on planet Earth today is not a scientist, is not a business person. The most important person on Earth today is the Holy Spirit. And listen to, about, listen to me, nobody loves Jesus more than Holy Spirit. So you never have to be afraid that Holy Spirit will take you off into some weird thing, some new doctrine, some new theology. No. Holy Spirit is always pointing you closer to Jesus. And this is very important for those of us who have known God for a long time, for those of us that church or Christianity is new to us, and especially those of us that are far from God and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus, out of all God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Jesus, we probably can relate to and understand the most. But I'm here to tell you that if you love Jesus, that if you want more of Jesus, then you've got to get connected with the person of Holy Spirit. Because no one loves Jesus more than Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit won't take you away from Jesus. Holy Spirit will always reveal Jesus, talk about Jesus, show you Jesus, draw you closer to Jesus. Because no one loves Jesus more than the person of Holy Spirit spirit. Jesus would go on to teach us, number two, that Holy Spirit is an inner voice. In fact, there's a number of scriptures that we're going to look at where Jesus himself talked about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, this, this holy inner voice that you and I can have access to if we don't keep him at arm's length. The Holy Spirit is an inner voice. Jesus said this about Holy Spirit in John 16, 8, when he comes, the Holy Spirit he will convict, or another good word there for convict is convince the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In other words, what Jesus was saying is that one of the roles of Holy Spirit is to convince men and women, people far from God, that they're lost and sinners in need of a Savior. That's one of Holy Spirit's roles, is to convince or convict the world of sin. And once you say yes to Jesus, he then convinces us that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Why? Because our own hearts 
and our own minds will try to condemn us. The Holy Spirit convinces us as part of his role that in a voice to remind us of not who we've been, but who we are now in Christ Jesus. And he also convinces us or convicts us that the enemy of this world has already been judged and defeated. In 1 Corinthians 12, 3, the Bible says no one can say Jesus is Lord except how? By the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit was the, the person of the Godhead that was involved in your life the moment you and I said yes to follow Jesus. You thought it was the preacher. You thought it was the televangelist or the evangelist or the missionary or the pastor. It was none of those. We were instruments used of God, but Holy Spirit was the one nudging your heart, warming your heart, convincing you of a need of a Savior because you were lost. And Holy Spirit did the miracle of you being born again and following Jesus today. He was involved at that moment of conversion. That's Holy Spirit. That inner voice. Holy Spirit is the inner voice in my life in very practical ways. When I'm getting ready to say something to my wife or my kids that I shouldn't say, I get that Holy Spirit inner voice. Juan, you shouldn't say that right now. <laughs> Holy Spirit, he's the inner voice. He's also my teacher. Holy Spirit is my teacher. The reason this should be good news to all of us is, is, listen, you can read the Bible and get revelation without having to go to Bible school or, the, or seminary. Because Holy Spirit is a good teacher. And not only is he a good teacher, but he is your teacher. He is my teacher. In John 14, 26, Jesus said that the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Where can we find everything that Jesus has taught us? We find it in his word. We find it in the book, in the Bible. And so it's upon us to actually get in his word and get in the Bible. And when we do, even though at times it's dark and we don't understand it and we're confused, Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and he becomes our teacher. It's like he is the flashlight in the room of the word. When I go to God's word and I'm confused and I don't understand it, Holy Spirit is my teacher. He shines brightly on the pages and the words in this book and make them come to life. And things that were written thousands of years ago, all of a sudden, they're relevant. They're now. They're for me. They give instruction. They give direction because Holy Spirit is my teacher. Jesus would go on to say that in 1 John 2, 27, that you have received the Holy Spirit and he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true for the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. Now, he's not saying that you don't need pastors and you don't need teachers because obviously, biblically, we know that that's not the case. What he's saying is, is that Holy Spirit will speak into your heart truth. He will speak and teach you things in your heart, things that, I mean, it's amazing uh, people that are new in the faith, the stuff that they come up with. I, I remember just this, this past year, last year, someone very new in their faith wrote us a card of appreciation. Now, this young lady is new to the faith. She's not gone to Bible school. She's not gone to preaching school. But here's one of the, the things that she wrote in that card. She was thanking us for creating an atmosphere where she could encounter Jesus and be born again. And here's what she wrote. She wrote, God was the last thing I tried and the first thing that worked. You got to go, to, go to preaching school to come up with lines like that. But, but here's, here's somebody new in the faith, and she writes this compelling truth that's so powerful. Why? Because Holy Spirit is at work and active in her life, teaching her that she doesn't have to go anywhere else to find joy and hope and salvation and deliverance and forgiveness of sin. That God is the one-stop shop. When you get him, you get everything you need. When you get him, you get the full shebang. God is all you need. And you can spend tens of thousands of dollars going to seminary to have a, a, a dry theologian teach you that. But when Holy Spirit is your teacher, he'll teach you truths. He'll teach you things. He's also my guide. Holy Spirit is a person. He's my inner voice. He's my teacher. He's my guide. Young people especially, especially listen to me. 
when you're living in those moments of those young years where you're graduating high school or graduating college and your future is ahead of you and you don't know what to do and what to major in and what to minor in and where to go and what to do. Holy Spirit, there is no junior Holy Spirit. There is no young adult Holy Spirit. There is no teenager Holy Spirit. There is one Holy Spirit and the same Holy Spirit that guides me and the same Holy Spirit that guides pastors and evangelists and prophets and apostles is the same Holy Spirit that will guide you 19 year old, 18 year old, 17 year old. He'll guide you because Holy Spirit is my guide to young newlyweds, to young families with, with little kids and, and no one's ever taught you how to do this. He, Holy Spirit can be your guide to businessmen and women, business owners, entrepreneurs. Holy Spirit can be your guide to those of you living in the fourth quarter of life and, and no one's ever taught you how to, how to, how to slow down and, and live life in that stage of life. Holy Spirit can be your guide. He'll guide you. In fact, the Bible says in John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and what he will tell you is what is yet to come. I know in my life there have been moments where it's not been a matter of decision or choice, but really one of timing. One of those moments was about, about when to get married, when to get engaged. Now, there was no doubt in my mind that this girl was going to be my wife. I knew that as a senior in high school. Now, if you're a senior in high school, um, you know, I, I don't know that that works for everybody, but I knew she'd be my wife. We're Bible college students, and she knew I was going to be her husband, I, and I knew she was going to be my wife, but we didn't know the timing. Do we wait till we graduate Bible college? Do we wait after we graduate Bible college, get a job and have some income and get a house and do it that way? Do we do it early? Do we, we didn't know. We needed timing. But guess what? We had Holy Spirit as a guide. Because one of my fears was going to her dad. Uh, if you've ever known George Zetz, looks like a lumberjack. And here I am, this skinny little uh, Puerto Rican, going to ask her lumberjack dad. I've got no job. I've, I've got Bible college debt. I'm not in ministry, I'm 19 years old, right? And I'm, I wanna ask him for his daughter's hand in marriage. I was, I was scared. And so, Holy Spirit, we need you to guide us. And so that's what we did. We took three days to pray and to fast and say, Holy Spirit, guide us on the timing of this. And thank God, he said, hey, go ahead and get engaged. And we did, they gave us the, the green light. A year and a half later, at 20 and 21, we were married. And now, 23 years later, we thank God that Holy Spirit was our guide, is our guide, and will continue to be our guide. But then there were moments where it wasn't just timing, it was actually choice, it was actually decision. It was the time when we were on staff here back in mid-2000s, and it was, it was a great season for us, and then a choice came before us for pastoring a church in the area. And that initially, my first reaction was, no way, I'm not leaving the best church in the area, this God is moving here, but, but God started nudging our hearts, and so we had to pray, God, is this the choice you want us to make? And I remember going and my wife and I interviewing with the board, the deacon board of that church. And one of the things they told us up front is that, listen, we're not making a decision today. In fact, it'll probably be a few days that we'll contact you and let you know how things went. And if it went well, maybe we'll invite you back and whatever. And so we did the interview and we're driving home. And as we're driving home, asking God about this choice, this decision, our guide, Holy Spirit, he begins to speak to us. He begins to tell us things like, I'm making your path straight, your way smooth. You don't need to fear. And as we're driving home, we're not five minutes away from the interview. We get a phone call from one of the deacons. We've decided that we want you guys to come back. And so it's like, all right, God, you're in control. You're moving us forward. You're our guide. And then we came to another similar decision just a few years ago when we felt like God was calling us back to Victory Christian Center. We needed Holy Spirit as our guide, and he is. Isaiah 30, verse 21 says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Why? Because Holy Spirit will be your guide if you let him. So not only is he a person, is he my inner voice, is he my teacher, is he my guide? Lastly, he's my friend. Holy Spirit is my friend. And I want to take it just a little bit further and encourage you and say that not only is he my friend, but he's my best friend. And I want to encourage you to not just make Holy Spirit your friend, but make him your best friend. How do you make anybody your best friend? 
You spend time with them. You talk to them. You do things together. You spend time together. Quality time. Quantity time. You get to know them. You get to know what they like and what they don't like. Listen, Holy Spirit is a person. He's got likes. He's got dislikes. He's got emotions. You can grieve him. You can upset him. You can make him joyful. He's got emotions. Make him your best friend. Talk to him. Holy Spirit is my friend. John 14, 16, it says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Why is Jesus saying another? Because he's looking at his disciples, and this is just after he got done telling them, Hey, I'm leaving. I'm going away. And they didn't want to hear that. And so whenever Jesus said, I'm giving you another, he was saying, Listen, I'm giving you someone just like me. And he's going to be a counselor. That word in the Greek is, means someone who comes alongside. So if you ever feel alone, if you ever feel like there's no one to help you, no one to talk to, no one in your world that understands, I'm here to tell you that Holy Spirit, if, he make him, if you make him, make him your friend, he'll come alongside of you. And he's not fair weathered. He'll be with you through thick and thin. He'll be right beside you, carrying burdens with you. He'll be winning with you. He'll be living with you, doing life with you, guiding you, teaching you. You, speaking to you. Make Holy Spirit your best friend. This is the role of Holy Spirit in your life. Do we understand that God the Father, God the Son, and God Holy Spirit, they all have roles that they play in our lives? Yeah, God the Father has a role, Jesus has a different role, and Holy Spirit has a role. In fact, in the Bible, in the letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, in the benediction of 2 Corinthians in chapter 13, He actually spells out the roles of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You tracking? It says in verse 14, the amazing grace of the Master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. So here are the roles. He just spelled them out. God the Father loves me. That's his role. Why is that important? It's because there are wounds that only a father can cause and wounds that only a father can heal. And God the Father is not mad at you. He is for you and not against you. God the Father's role is to love you. God the Father loves you. God the Father loves me. And then God the Son, he saves me. It's the grace of Jesus. He paid the price for my sin. But what's the role of Holy Spirit? God the Holy Spirit is with me. He is with me for intimate friendship. You say, well, I want to be intimately friends with Jesus or intimate friends with God the Father. Well, the good news is it's the mystery of the Godhead, the mystery of the Trinity, that you have three distinct persons, yet they're one. And you never have to be afraid that if you get closer to the Holy Spirit, that you move farther from God, the Father, or farther from Jesus. It's just the opposite. If you want more of the love of God and experience more of the grace of Jesus, and if you want to get to know Jesus better and make him an even better friend in your life, well, then get closer to the Holy Spirit. Because his role is to come alongside of you, and he never takes you away to himself, but he'll always draw you closer to Jesus. And Jesus will always draw you closer to the Father. And the Father will always draw you closer to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will always draw you closer to Jesus. And Jesus will always draw you closer to the Father. And the Father will always draw you closer to the Holy Spirit. It is insane the way they put each other first. No, it's you. No, it's you. No, it's you. No, it's you. Holy Spirit, his role is to enter an intimate relationship with you so that you can know God better. Because he is God and he loves you and he wants to work in your life. Go ahead and give him thanks for just a moment. I remember, um, I remember whenever I received what uh, they experienced in Acts chapter 2 in those first few vo- verses uh, that, that they call the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I was born again when I was 16 years old. When I was 16 years old, I was born again. And that's, that's whenever... Um, the Holy Spirit did the miracle of, of baptizing me into Jesus. I was in Christ when I was born again. 16 years old, I grew up in the church, but at the age of 16, it's like everything I knew about God and understood about God in my head made a bridge to my heart. And so I believed with my heart and then confessed with my mouth that the Lord Jesus Christ had died, had risen from the grave, and he died for me. And in my bedroom, on, on, on the side of my bed, on my knees, 
for the last time, I gave my life to Jesus completely, and I was born again. And the miracle that God did was the Holy Spirit was involved in that moment, and he took me out of Adam, he took me out of my sinful nature, and he placed me in Jesus. And so now I was a new creation in Christ Jesus. My history was wrapped up in what the Bible calls the second Adam, Jesus. But then when I was about 17 years of age, because, because whenever I got born again, I just wanted to know Jesus better. I love Jesus. He was my Savior. He was my Lord. And so what would I do? I would pray more, and then I would read the Bible more. And I began really getting into the Bible. I began getting into the Word. And it was an exciting time where I was reading it and didn't understand it all. I, it was confusing at times, but I was reading it. I was highlighting things. I loved going from the Old and New Testament and how things tied together and stuff that maybe I had heard. I now read. And I said, oh, that's where that's found. And I would highlight it, and then I would pray more, and then I would read the Bible more. And then I'd take that big Bible, that big King James Bible to school, and I would be excited to take it to school and not care who knew that I carried a Bible and I love Jesus and, and I would do that. And it's like God the Father saw my hunger, my desire, my thirst for more of him. And he finally at the age of 17 says, we're going to baptize him now in the Holy Spirit. When I was born again, the Holy Spirit came and baptized me in Jesus at the age of 16. But at 17, Jesus came and then baptized me in the Holy Spirit. I experienced that speaking in tongues, and it was at that moment that this call, this passion, this unrelenting pursuit of preaching the gospel was birthed. When Holy Spirit, when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I wanted to become a witness of the things that Jesus said and did. I wanted to tell the world that there is a God, and he has a son, and to reconcile the lost world to God's son and to God himself, Right? And that's what happened. I remember during that time reading a book that made me so jealous. The title of the book was Good Morning, Holy Spirit. And I would read it and I became jealous. I want to know Holy Spirit that way. I want to be able to wake up in the morning and say good morning the same way that I turn around and I say, hey, honey, good morning to my wife. I want to wake up in the morning and know that he's there and feel that he's there and understand that he's there and wake up and say good morning, Holy Spirit, and live my life with a conscious awareness of his love for me, of his desire for me, and of his presence in my life. And that journey started at a young age. In Ephesians 4, verse 30 it says, don't grieve God, don't break his heart. His Holy Spirit moving and breathing in you is the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. Holy Spirit is a gift. Don't take him for granted. So how can I know him? How can I know Holy Spirit? Let me give you three powerful yet simple prayers. Three powerful yet simple prayers that I want all of us, especially in the climate that we're in, political climate, cultural climate, 2020 climate, COVID climate, in the climate that we're in, here are some prayers for us to take away this morning and make them our own this week. Here's the first one. Let me give you three of them. The first one is this. Holy Spirit, show me. That's it. Pray that. Holy Spirit, show me. In other words, reveal yourself to me. Better yet, reveal me to me. I love the way David says it in the book of Psalms, chapter 139. He said, he said to God, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Holy Spirit, show me. Show me, reveal yourself to me. Show me me. Show me the areas of my life that I need to see. I love that verse because in those couple verses in Psalms 139, that, that prayer, Holy Spirit, show me, it means, and we read it in those verses, it's saying, search me, know me, test me, see me, and lead me. Search me, Holy Spirit, know me, show me. Show me what's going on. Show me. I pray that prayer every time I'm getting ready to counsel, counsel someone over the phone or give some counsel or, or minister to someone where my wisdom and my knowledge and my intellect is limited. I'll say, Holy Spirit, show me. 
Holy Spirit, show me. There are moments in life where I, I need something more than what I can get out of a book. I need some divine intervention. Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm, I'm unsettled in this stage in life. I'm, I'm unsettled. I'm scared. I'm afraid. I don't have the faith. I'm, 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 I don't know what to do. Holy Spirit, show me. Second prayer is this. Holy Spirit, change me. Because now that he's shown you something, ask him to change you. It's incredibly important that you don't stay where you started. And that you don't stay where you are. Because we are all growing in our journey with God. And everyone has a next step. I have a next step. You have a next step. And every time you take steps, you grow. And I may not be where I want to be, but I thank God I'm not where I used to be. And we want to make it incredibly easy for people to take their next step. Some people are taking it today. They're actually right now in the next step class where they're learning more about who God is and how they can be part of the body of Christ. We saw 18 people take their next step in water baptism last Sunday night as we gathered 300 strong in this room and we worshiped God and we celebrated people that have recently said yes to Jesus take their next step in water baptism publicly. Come on, let's celebrate that for just a moment. Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, change me. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18 says, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image, into the image of Jesus Christ. So the work of Holy Spirit, the, cha the change that he wants to do in my life and in your life, the change he wants to do in Juan Rivera's life, Holy Spirit is not interested in making a better version of Juan. You can, you can go get that at, 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 at the, you know, you, you can go to the Holiday Inn whenever they have that, that motivational speaker to get a better version of you. You can watch Dr. Phil. You can watch Oprah and become a better version of you. Holy Spirit is not interested in such things. When I became born again, version 1.0 of Juan Rivera died. And so now Holy Spirit is working in me, not a better version of me, but he's working in me, Jesus. He's working in me, the image of the Son. He's working in me, the character, the attributes, the doings, the actions, the motives, the heart of the Son of Jesus. He is trying to work Jesus in me. He wants one to die more and more and more and more, and Jesus to be seen more and more and more and more. That's the work of Holy Spirit in our lives. Lives, and we, we need to let him do that. There's too much confusion in the church world today. Holy Spirit, change me. And then finally and lastly, the last prayer is Holy Spirit, fill me. In other words, give me everything you have. God, I want more. Holy Spirit, fill me. I want more. I want everything that you have. Anything that you have for me, I want it. I want it. It's both a safe and dangerous prayer to pray all at the same time. Because it will change your life. And Holy Spirit will work in you some things. It's a powerful prayer. And these three simple yet powerful prayers can do more to the body of Christ here at Victory Christian Center and to many of you watching online than anything else can do in the next days and weeks and months to come. Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, change me. Holy Spirit, fill me. God, I want more of you. In fact, in Ephesians 5.18, it says... Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. And so some of you, you you've just, you've, 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 you've kind of disqualified yourself because you said, well, I'm not a drinker, or I'm just a social drinker. I don't get drunk. 
Okay, well, maybe you don't get drunk on alcohol. But as a culture, we get drunk on so many other things. We get drunk to the point that it changes our behavior. It changes the way we think. It changes the way we act. And we are struggling in society today with people that are drunk on everything else and not filled with the Holy Spirit. And it happens in the church. Pat yourself on the back because you don't drink. Or maybe if you do, it's only a couple beers a week. He wasn't just talking about wine. But what are we getting drunk on? What are we filling ourselves with that blinds us? That blurs our senses? That brings confusion? That makes you walk funny? That makes you stumble? That makes you sick? And we fill ourselves and gorge ourselves and we become drunk with the music of this world and the tune of the Pied Piper of the spirit of the age. And we become drunk on political ideologies. And we become drunk with the world and drunk with things and drunk with passions and drunk with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And God is looking at his church and he's saying, stop getting drunk with the world and get filled with my Holy Spirit. Because I'm here to declare to you today that the answer to a lost and broken and hopeless and, and, and broken and divided world is a Holy Spirit filled church. Not weird, but wired. Wired to God. Wired to His Holy Spirit. Filled with His presence and His power. Not pathetic, but prophetic. Not broken, but whole. Holy Spirit, fill me. Now, Pastor Juan, I've already been filled. Acts 13.52 says that the disciples were continually, continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. In other words, God has more. God has more. There's more. There's more. And we need now more than ever a spirit-filled, spirit-empowered church that are led by him, that are taught by him, that are empowered by him, that move with him, and that, allow God, that allows God to permeate the world. We need him now more than ever. We need his voice. We need his leading. We need the Holy Spirit. Those three prayers I want you to take with you today and pray them. Put down your phones, shut off the TV, and say, Holy Spirit, show me. Holy Spirit, change me. And Holy Spirit, fill me. And pick up this book and allow Holy Spirit to do the work that he wants to do. Yet people will point at what they don't understand and either make fun of it or reject it. And I get it. It's not uncommon for those that say that they're spirit-filled to make other Christians who haven't had that experience yet make feel, makes them feel like second-class citizens of the kingdom. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe to such a degree that you say, I don't want, listen, I just, I just want a good church that preaches the word. I love Jesus. I'm going to heaven. I don't want to get into that stuff. But this is that. It's for you, and it's good, and it's God. And if someone's hurt you in the name of Holy Spirit, or maybe someone's turned you off because they were weird, listen, they're just weird. But listen to me. Holy Spirit doesn't make me better than you. He makes me better than me. 
And, and that's the point. We need to be better. And the person on the planet that can most help you is Holy Spirit. He's the most important person on planet Earth today. No one loves Jesus more than Holy Spirit. And we need the person of Holy Spirit because by myself, I am not enough. By yourself, you're not enough. But with God, we are more than enough. We're more than enough. So as you leave here today, in just a moment, take these three powerful prayers with you. Write them down. Pray them. In which God do some extraordinary things. I'll share one last story and then we'll pray. A number of years ago, I had a gentleman come into my office. He came in with his wife. And as they began to share, I thought I was in trouble as a pastor because, see, this gentleman had grown up Baptist all of his life, staunch Baptist, believed in God's word, but all of the extra stuff he really wasn't into. Some of the things that we talked about today, he really didn't understand. But he sat in my wife in, 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 my, in my office with his wife, and I thought I was going to get in trouble because his wife began to share an experience that she had in her bathroom because she prayed that, those prayers. And when she prayed the prayer, Holy Spirit, fill me, he did. He did. Listen, you never have to worry that Holy Spirit will jump on you. He won't jump on you. But he'll come. He'll come when you ask him to. When there's that hunger and that thirst, oh, he'll come. And she did. And not in a church, not in a conference, not in a revival, but in a bathroom in her home. Holy Spirit filled her. And with her Baptist husband sitting beside her, she began to tell me how Pastor Juan, I've been speaking in tongues for the last six months. I got filled with the baptism in the Holy Spirit. She's with tears in eyes said, Pastor, it's changed my life. I love my husband more. I love Jesus more. And with tears in his eyes, this husband looked at me. When I thought he was going to ream me out for doing something, putting some voodoo on his wife, he looked at me with tears in his eyes. And he said, Pastor, I don't know what happened to my wife, but whatever she has, I want it too. It wasn't probably a month or two later that during a service, during the worship time, Holy Spirit came and invaded the service. There were people coming up receiving prayer. He was one of them. We laid hands on him. Holy Spirit filled him so beautifully, so wonderfully. That man would later on, in about a year's time, he actually became a congressman, and he still is to this day. He's a congressman in this area. Recently, the congressman called me, and he said, Hey, my nephew, my brother's son, they live in Texas, but... My, um, my nephew, he's, he's going to get a scholarship at YSU. He's going to play baseball for YSU. And so I want you to meet them because it, when the sun's up here, I want, I want him to attend your church. And so the congressman and his wife um, had me meet his brother, sister-in-law, and the nephew. And we were just talking and, you know, and they shared about how they attend this really big Baptist church in Texas. And so I'm just kind of like, okay, you know, that's cool. You know, when... You know, I, uh, you're not the only one that label people. Pastors do it too. So in my mind, I just automatically labeled them as, you know, they're just kind of, they're Bible people. They love Jesus. But, um, but as they were talking, the wife, the, the congressman's sister-in-law began sharing a similar story about how she grew up in a church like this but had been praying for her husband like her brother, the congressman, had grown a Baptist all his life. And in the bathroom, I don't know what it is with bathrooms. <laughs> her husband prayed that prayer, Holy Spirit filled me, and he did. He did. And it's so exciting to see that Holy Spirit is doing his work on the earth today.
We need God. And I don't need for us to be a church that's right with everybody, that pleases everybody. I want us to be a church that's right with God, that pleases God. I don't want a room full of blue or red, of donkey or elephants. I want a room full of people that are committed to the Lamb. And no matter how you vote, no matter on which party line, I want us to be mature. I want us to be prophetic and not pathetic. I want us to love enemies, pray for those who despitefully use us. I want us to be a church of prayer. I want us, I want us to be a church that if we ever cease to exist in this region or community, it'll mean something. We'd be missed. So I want us to be a church that impacts this region. I want to reach the world. I want you, I want your sons and daughters to go global. I want to support missionaries that are being taught at Victory Kids right now. That 15 years from now, we're sending them out. And we're doing our part to invest in them. I want us to be known in heaven. I want us to be people, all of us, the least of us in this room, that without titles, without degrees, and without certificates, the least in this room can cast out devils, can heal the sick, can preach the gospel. I want us to be the church that God died for and the church that he's coming back for. Church that God says they're ready. Let's go. I want to preach the gospel until all have heard. I want us to be a part of reaching the tribes, the nations, and the languages that have yet heard Jesus. They've tasted Coke. They've tasted a Coca-Cola, but they've not tasted how good our God is. Because how can they hear if no one's sent? And how can someone be sent unless that place in which they've been planted has a vision to reaching the far corners of the earth. I don't want to play games. This isn't a job. This isn't a career. We've been called by God for such a time as this to make an impact, to preach, to give, to serve, to love. It's my heart. And so now I know things are crazy in the world. I know things are crazy in our nation. I know there's some of you here that are celebrating. I celebrate with you. Some of you here that are scared and mourning. I'm more with you. Because I love us. I love you. And I believe in God. And I believe in his church. And our greater days are ahead of us. Can we stand to our feet? If you're far from God, you don't have to be. If you're watching online, you're far from God, you don't have to be. You can pray a simple prayer that says, God, I need you. And I give you my life today. Admit that you're a sinner in need of God. The Holy Spirit will help you experience the miracle of salvation the same way he helped me many years ago. He'll do the same for you. So if you're far from God, you don't have to be today. Just open up your heart to Jesus. Open up your heart to the Holy Spirit. 
and say, Jesus, save me. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose again. He died for you and rose again for you. Receive him unto yourself. Open up the door of your heart and he'll do that miracle. Before we leave here today, I want to encourage you with God's word where it says in Zephaniah 3.17, for the Lord your God wins victory after victory and is always with you. He celebrates and sings because of you and he will refresh your life with his love.